Oh, right. they are. They so did, are. You did you mention already, Jaladan, that these things are a microserver? Yes. It's a microserver on a card. That's how I caught the attention, actually. <laughs> Every card it looks like an electric view. I think I heard that. It's a graphics card. Uh, but they combine, so this is the uh, same uh, high performance networking core. Uh, we have examples from Mellanox and Broadcom uh, with with ARM cores, right? So, um, which means on on each card there is the ARM processor yes. and the memory. Correct. That's correct. So every every one of these cards is a, is a little microserver that so has compute, memory, and uh, networking I/O, and you know some other things around it, like some basic storage as well. So, and in here, actually, you see an interesting use case where they're not plugged into an actual server, right? So usually you would put these smart ticks into a server. And if I did that, that wouldn't be very interesting because you wouldn't see anything. But um, if you look at the Broadcom Stingray uh, example, that, that's, the, that's the larger card in this uh, it looking carrier board. It's, the carrier board is actually a, 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 a passive motherboard. For, for what do you call a carrier board? This, oh sorry, it's this little thing oh, here, right? So there are PCI slots right up to the right of that, and if you were to plug uh, devices uh, next to that, the operating system on the SmartNIC would be able to use them, right? So, does that give you any ideas? Yeah, a little bit. So, uh, the way I see it... I don't understand why it's separated, you know? I mean... Three cards. Three cards over here, one card over there. Uh, the reason it's separated because so this is just a power, this is a basic backlane just to provide power to all these cards. I could move them over there uh, and then they will be visible to the OS uh, or the hypervisor running here as just PCI devices they could use. I mean, they will still run, right? Uh, I just separated them out just to really, really, really send a message that these are completely separate systems, right? I mean, ideally, I would have one plugged into every single different backplane, but that's not economical space-wise. So I, I plug them into a shared backplane, but they're not really talking to each other, right? They're just getting the power. So what could you do with this? Um, so I see SmartNix as a, um, as a building block for uh, edge compute gateways, for uh, CPE, you know what CPE is? So uh, customer premise equipment. Uh, so uh, little telco boxes that provide network functionality uh, on customer premises. It could be uh, you know, packet routing, filtering, firewalls, VPNs, that sort of thing. Um, obviously, uh, you could put them into a server. Um, and that also becomes interesting because you can then offload um, some of the operations on the whole CPU onto those cards. So what you could offload is some networking operations, storage operations. This hypothetically could be used to disaggregate our own hypervisor, for example. This makes me think of uh, architecture we had on the blades. So, it's, it's, that's an interesting thought. Uh, I would almost be thinking more, because the blades are individual systems. I mean, they, they plug into a backplane that would uh, provide power and, and, and networking. But in this case, I would think more about it, if you go back to mainframe days, it's more like I.O. processors. Right, so where, where I.O. processes were you know, real computers, right, that r ran I.O. programs and they communicated over a channel, but it was, it was actually a communication channel, right, so they were not slave devices, really. Um, the SmartNix could allow us to re-architect um, what a server looks like, what a rack looks like, what a data center looks like, uh, to obviously achieve, uh, uh, you know, better whole CPU utilization because we really want customers to use the whole CPU. Right. We can give as many, many of those CPU cycles to our customers, that's all for the better. So, of course, if we are able to use uh, the smart neck, that's one use case. Uh, it wouldn't be great to offload customer workloads to the smart neck as well. I could imagine that for maybe some HPC use case or um, you know, in some financial kind of trading situation, you may want to run workloads as close to the wire as possible you know, to either achieve extremely low latencies or to deal with a high throughput of data. You don't want it to pollute the entire system. Maybe you're just interested in analyzing data quickly, maybe from some kind of particle accelerator, and you just want to quickly filter and get the right data. You don't really care for you know petabytes of data and landing on your server. You just want to find the extrema, right? So each SmartNIC, there is a memory, CPU, but there is no storage, right? Uh, so that's an interesting question. So all, obviously, all of them have very simple storage for, for booting. Some of them may have uh, flash storage, right? Uh, and that could be presented as a UFS or NVMe. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, 
they can be run in this mode where they can use um, other PCI Express endpoints like, like that one. So I could have on that card uh, an NVMe adapter plugged in. But you know, for the purpose of this demonstration, all of these cards are actually booting uh, using an iSCSI, an iSCSI LUN. So I could show you another SmartNIC, well, same chip. So what we have here is the same um, Mellanox Bluefield SOC as we have on those Mellanox Bluefield SmartNICs, but it's a slightly larger SKU, it's clocked a little higher. These are storage servers. So in the back you have 200 gigabit ports, which could do either Ethernet or InfiniBand. And up in the front here, this answers your other question is, this is all NVMe disks. So what could you do with this? I'm running ESXi and a vSAN cluster here. So there's a vSAN, there's a three node vSAN cluster here formed with these two machines. And this is a 1U Lenovo box with an Ampere EMAG. It's a 32 core uh, ARM server. And uh, it, yeah, so, so running ESXi. Uh, and uh, yes, they're all built to the same standards. So it's the same image. And uh, I, I really want to harp back on the whole, those are microservers on a car because they built the same standards that enable ESXi or another general purpose operating system hypervisor to run on the ARM systems. These standards, uh, is, there's a hardware standard called the server-based system architecture and a firmware standard called the uh, server-based booting requirements. There's a lot of server in there, right? But these specs basically make ARM infrastructure look like x86 infrastructure. Use EFI and ACPI, use kind of common sense approaches to IOMMUs, PCI, that sort of thing. But uh, a few weeks back uh, at the ARM TechCon, this is the ARM, uh, ARM's kind of premier customer meeting, um, uh, they came out and said that uh, these are not service standards. These are standards you have to adopt for any footprint if you want to run general purpose operating systems, right? Which kind of makes sense because if you look at a, an x86 server or a laptop, you're never wondering if you can boot the same uh, OS there, right? You can obviously do that, right? So here's another vSAN cluster. Um, this is vSAN at the edge. Um, this is using a, a Marvel Armada uh, board. It's, uh, it's called the Celebron Macadabin. It's the same one that we have sitting uh, uh, on the table over there. The Macadabin is the, it's a reference um, NAV de community and NAV development platform uh, because a lot of where these chips go is sort of networking equipment, kind of that, those CPU boxes I was telling you about. And um, this is the platform we actually used to sh show ESXi ARM last year at the VMworld, right? But here now it's running a four terabyte vSAN um, array. And um, why, why is that important at the edge? Uh, redundancy. Ah, yes, because we keep telling how we, we believe yeah, resilience is very important for the edge. Because of where you could be operating, because of the criticality of the, the workloads, the, the, the requirement to do maintenance without downtime. But how can you talk about that without having a, a resilient and, 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 and secure storage? Well, we have that. And uh, I can also show you that we can run vSAN in the cloud. Did you know that uh, Amazon had ARM servers? They do. So Amazon uh, last year at reInvent, reInvent is the AWS's VMworld-like conference, they launched their A1 instances uh, on their own custom ARM server chip called the Graviton. Now, for the last year, those were virtual instances, which means they ran on top of AWS's hypervisor. Just a few weeks back, they launched the A1 metal instances. Now, those metal instances uh, is the bare metal. Exactly. Whole box, which means, and, and, and incidentally, that's how we do VMC on AWS, right? We use metal instances because we run our hypervisor using AWS's infrastructure. So, yes, we can run A1 uh, Metal on um, uh, ESXi on A1 Metal. I can show you, for example, here, you can see, uh, you can see, say, Amazon EC2 A1 Metal. You can run VMs there. Uh, we would love to do VMC on R, right? Uh, in fact, uh, you know, we are, I can kind of uh, capture that. Uh, now we, would, we are looking for early validation partners, right? There are no product plans. Uh, but it's interesting to us, but yeah, we, we need customers to come to us and, and tell us that yes, we would uh, like the ARM capacity in AWS to not be a silo. We would love to have it accessible using VMC. We could do some POCs together. 
and that, that obviously can lead uh, to uh, some kind of decision or optimization. So um, I can run vSAN in the cloud as well. So I have a, again a, a, a vSAN cluster right here um, formed using three other uh, A1 instances. <laughs> anyway, so we can think of ARM as a better efficiency platform than x86? That's an interesting question. Um, I would position it very differently. Apples to apples, ARM is functionally equivalent to x86. It's generally in the same performance ballpark, right? I mean, you have systems at extremely high end with Marvel Thunder X2, which are used in the HPC boxes today, and those are uh, Xeon Platinum grade machines, and you have your Raspberry Pis and things that are even you know, l lower scale than that. I think the ARM story is about right-sizing the harbor for the workload, right? And it's especially important at the edge where you have your environmental constraints, but you never really want to be in a position to go and, and have excess capacity. And it, it's important at the edge, right? But it's also important in the cloud. At, at, at the edge, your constraint is your environment, you know, the power. And at the cloud, your constraint is your wallet, right? But then you, you really got to be sure if you're deploying cloud scale workloads that you're not buying capacity you're not making good use of. Uh, and there's also what I call infrastructure use cases. So if I'm deploying some kind of software as a service, there are all those things that, and let's, let's say I'm doing something compute intensive and you know, the immediate endpoint has to run on an x86 box, but things like Nginx, um, load balancers, uh, some kind of database, they don't need to run. You know, in fact, Amazon and ARM uh, did a case study with Nginx and uh, I think they're claiming 40% cost savings of deploying on A1, right? Versus some other thing, right? So ARM can be low power, um, obviously, uh, some of the chips that are being sold today, uh, kind of in, a, in an infrastructure space, the vendors are talking about, you know, 15, 20% TDP savings. Uh, you know, I think conceptually, because uh, the ARM architecture does um, push some complexity to the operating system, it's a, you can probably do a, a, a simpler design to achieve similar performance, uh, but it doesn't have to be low power, right? I think it all boils down to choice, and having that ability to really right size the harbor, find the right system for your, not an average box, right, but, but the one that, that's right for your use case, right. Now VMware started as a consolidation company, but we've been hearing about uh, people have 20% CPU utilization, 5% memory utilization. That's just wait, that's just extremely wasteful, right. Um, I'll give you another example. We have a great uh, silicon partner with NXP. Uh, I'm really excited about NXP's uh, uh, edge compute solutions in the side of I IoT and CP space. Why? Because they have chips uh, everywhere, you know, the, the, it, 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 across anywhere between $50 to $1,000. Find, find the one that matches your use case. Maybe the $50 thing can be, you know, an SD-WAN appliance or a, a Raspberry Pi-like device. And then you know, the larger ones are, we need more performance, more throughput, more memory. Okay, a lot of inform information for our readers. Thanks very much for your interview. You're welcome.